<laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see such a large crowd. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for what I am sure is going to be a very exciting presentation on accepting the global challenge. I thought that before our speakers start, we would do a brief sort of Baptist-style call and response. So please repeat after me. Ni hao. Ni hao. Aseo. Aseo. I have to go to my notes now. Marharan, marhaban. Merhaba. Namaste. Salam. All right, wonderful. You have just said hello, or said some approximation of hello in the languages of Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Korean, Turkish, Hindi, and Persian. Why these languages? These are languages that you can study under the program we're going to be talking about this afternoon, NISLI, which stands for National Security Language Institute for Youth. This is a program sponsored by the United States Department of State that gives students the opportunity to travel abroad and engage in the intensive study of languages that are critical to the future diplomacy and foreign relations of the United States. These are languages that are less commonly taught in many secondary schools in the United States. Now, under the leadership of our uh, foreign languages or world languages group and uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Karen Rossi and Tanya Smith and Pilar Hillard and others, NCSSM has amassed an incredible record. Since the year 2009, we've had 19 students, 19, who have gone abroad to do intensive, immersive language study and they have done so in countries including China, Egypt, South Korea, India, and Morocco. So this afternoon you're going to hear about the amazing experiences that some of these students have had and that you yourself may be able to have. They're going to explain to you how this program works and how to apply for it. So before I turn things over, uh, because I have a captive audience, I want to put in one plug if you're interested in traveling to a fascinating country, there will be a mini term this year. Lila Sher and I will take a group of students to China. It's a wonderful mini term. And there is an interest meeting tomorrow at 4.20, right after school in Bell 9. You don't have to know how to speak Chinese, uh, although many people who apply for the trip do. But if you're interested, please come to our interest meeting. All right, well now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, that is Anli Zhang, who is a senior originally from Fuzhou, China, who now lives in Asheville, North Carolina, and who spent a fascinating summer in Morocco learning Arabic. Please welcome Anli. Country. Um, 
So I lived in Rabat for six weeks and plus one week um, pre-orientation in New York City. Dr. Hessen talked about what is Nestle Y. So it stands for National Security Language Initiative for Youth. It's sponsored by the U.S. Department of State. You don't have to pay anything if you get accepted. Um, previous language study is not required. I didn't know any Arabic before I went, and I, stu I studied Arabic from scratch in, Ro in Rabat, Morocco. So Nestle has two different programs. You can apply for a summer and academic program. Um, summer is about six to seven weeks, and academic year is about 10 months. And then um, if you're interested, you should definitely check out this website, and they have a lot more information online. So languages and countries, um, seven languages, and um, you get to travel to Morocco or Jordan, Oman, all those different countries. Um, so I chose Arabic, and they put me to in uh, under Morocco program. I didn't have choice to decide where, where um, which country I want to go. So like different people, different people will have different experiences. And for me, it was just life changing experience. I still have homesick from Morocco, and I remember I cried last week after I Skyped with my host parents in Morocco. And I think what makes this trip um, life changing for me is I integrated my previous personal experience to this program. I was born and raised in China for. 14 years, and then I moved here four years ago, and that's when I started learning English as my second language. And then since I was little, I have that I'm in love with um, Parisian romantic lifestyle. And then last year during mini turn, I went to Paris for a week, and I fell in love with Paris. I thought I'm going to learn French as my third language, but new opportunity popped in as I decided to learn Arabic as my third language. But interest, surprisingly, I found that um, almost every Moroccan speaks French. So uh, um, every, in, average, um, in average, every Moroccan speaks um, modern standard Arabic, Moroccan Arabic, and French, because it was colonized by France before. So why Morocco Arabic? Um, like I said, I don't have choice on countries, but I'm so glad that I went to Morocco. It's a very diverse country, and um, I want I chose Arabic because it's very different compared to my own personal um, background. I wanted I wanted to do I wanted to um, pick a language that's completely different um, compared to Chinese and English. And also discover the mystery. I didn't know anything about North Africa and the Middle East. And this summer, I learned so much about the culture, the language, the religion, Islam, and adventures. So here's here's Morocco. It's um, in North Africa. It's clo very close to Spain and Algeria. I lived in Rabat, the capital of Morocco, for six weeks with a um, local. Moroccan family. So my daily life in Morocco, in the morning we have modern standard Arabic um, class in about like five to six hours. And then in the afternoon we will have um, excursions such as cooking workshop, Islamic workshop. Uh, we will have, we had robot city tour, NGO visit, and commu community service. Um, in orphanage. We also had calligraphy workshop every Tuesday in Moroccan Arabic, which is called Darija, every Friday. Um, I learned modern standard Arabic um, in, in the, at the school there, but I spoke Mo Moroccan Arabic with my host family because most Moroccan speak Mo Moroccan Arabic. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so we went to so um, the princess from Morocco, Moroccan royal family, um, hosted a, a party for an orphanage, and then we were likely we were invited to go to the party and had an iftar 
which I will talk about is breaking the fast, um, dinner with them, and that's the party. And the picture on the upper right, that's a very, very famous um, singer in the Arab world. And he was invited by the princess too because the prince very likes him. <laughs> and then the, um, the lady in the poster here, she's actually my host sister-in-law. Surprisingly, my, uh, my host brother, she's an actor and filmmaker um, in Morocco. I didn't find out that until like the second week, at the end of second week. I was surprised. Yeah, and then I was just walking on the street in Rabat and I saw her poster. It was pretty cool. We, uh, had, we also had calligraphy um, class every Tuesday. That was a, that's a picture of me in Rabat Zoo during afternoon excursions. Hena. So, um, Hena is a Berber belief, means good luck. You will see in Morocco, you will see almost every girl wants to have like henna on their arms like, or ankles, that means good luck. That's actually my, my hand. Uh, we had very traditional Moroccan storytelling in Marrakesh. And that's a carnival in Rabat city. So Ramadan, we were there during Ramadan. Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. It's the holy month for Muslims. Um, so this month they fast. They have completely different sleeping schedule. And so they um, stop eating after sunrise. And okay, so they have two main meals during the day. Um, after sunset, they will have iftar, uh, which means breaking the fast. And then before sunrise, which is about 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, they will have another meal called suhu. And, and so during, so after, they can eat after sunset and before sunrise. I remember like, um, you can still see the kids playing, playing around the street at 3 a.m. in the morning because they have a completely different schedule. And one night my house mom woke me up 2 a.m. To, to have another meal, but it was fun. And then Eid is the last day, it's the festival at the end of Ramadan. Um, people usually um, get together with family and enjoy, um, enjoy like food, food and celebrate. So that's my meal every single day. Moroccan tends to, Moroccans tend to overfeed us. <laughs> yeah. See, like you can see like eggs and milk, they need like a lot of nutri nutrition during Ramadan month. We had an iftar service in, uh, in Rabat. Um, we serve iftar for those people who cannot afford mail. Um, we had a cooking workshop and that's mint tea. <coughs> I think it's the best tea in the world. It's awesome. And, yeah. So we also had weekend excursions. Um, except for weekend three and weekend six. Weekend three, I fasted. I stayed at home and then fasted. It was, it was a really fun experience. And then week six, free weekend, we said goodbye to our host family and friends. So week one, we went to Sahara. It was a life-changing experience. I don't know how to describe my feeling when I would climb up all the way to the, the top of the center. It was just fascinating when you stand there and look at the sunset and think like and then appreciate your life yeah when I was on the top of the sand I felt like my life is complete <laughs> of course selfie <laughs> yeah and unicorn on camel <laughs> Shafshawan is a city of blue, so the entire town is painted blue. And picture here is a city in north northern tip of Morocco. Um, it's called Tangier, and you can see Mediterranean Sea over there. And people there speak Spanish a lot. 
that brings Chef Shaolin, our group. Poor Chef Shaolin. Um, we had lunch facing the Mediterranean Sea. That was awesome. And that's um, the world famous traveler, Ibn, Ibn Battuta's house in Morocco. Marrakesh and Casablanca. So, so this is the world famous square um, in Marrakesh. It's a Moscow place in Marrakesh. It's very touristy, very hot, but very fun. Also very fun. Magnus Fez and Volulis. So this is in Volulis. It's a city between um, Magnus and Fez. It's in partially excavated Roman city in Morocco. This is the Arch of Victory. This is in a um, very famous pottery complex in Fez. Of course, we went to the tannery and we smelled the leather. Um, this is in Cafe Clock. I, the entire group loved the cafe. Um, it's owned by an Englishman who fell in love with Morocco um, five years ago, and he decided to go move to Morocco and, and open this cafe. But even though it's owned by an Englishman, but um, people who work who work there are all Moroccan. So the food, the dessert, the mint tea are very authentic. So Arabic class, we had modern, we learned modern standard Arabic, but I kind of had to learn Moroccan Arabic because my host family spoke Moroccan Arabic with me all the time. And it's very intense, a lot of material and a lot of homework. And we had different levels. I was in the beginner, beginner's level. We also had intermediate and advanced. We had midterm exam, final exam, oral exam, and final presentation, which is all in Arabic. So it was very intense. Um, a girl who studied Arabic before, she said six weeks in Rabat, she learned um, a amount of, amount of Arabic that she learned in one year back in her high school. So it was a life-changing trip. It was really awesome and it changed my future study career path. And one thing I learned is how to appreciate your life. Like being in Morocco let me, makes me appreciate my life and um, my life more. And like the feeling you, the feeling, and also um, the epiphany you get when you're abroad. Um, those are awesome. And I just uh, discover myself too because. Um, before I went to Morocco, I was that kind of overachiever, I believe you guys are too. Um, overworked, plan, plan, work, work, overprogrammed. But then this summer, I learned how to relax, and I think that's very important for us um, to know that um, the importance of relaxation in our life. And yeah, the friendship, the connection with local Moroccans are awesome. And this is my blog. I spend a lot of time on my blog. And if you're interested, you should check this out. And um, I almost, I almost blog every day. And so you will, if you read through it, you will get a, like very basic idea of what I done every day in, Mor in Morocco. Thank you. Lily Herbert, she's a um, junior at UNC Chapel Hill. She um, is a Nestle alumnus uh, in 2010 and 2011 to 2012. She went to Russia for the summer and academic year program. And she's also the Nestle um, Chapel Hill slash Southeast representative. Let's welcome Lily.
and East Asia. So this is um, Nowruz. Does anyone know what the holiday Nowruz is? It's actually the Persian New Year, um, but it's spread also through Central Asia. So we get to celebrate it in Kazakhstan. And these, are, I think, are Iraqi students. They're doing a traditional Iraqi dance. And this is also, I think, Victory Day. OK, so uh, probably the best part was not school, but um, local life. So my group and I became really, really close. This doesn't always happen, but they were some of the coolest kids ever, and I'm still in touch with them. And um, we did tutoring at local schools. So I went to a school there where they taught an entire language, and I helped with English classes, which you might get the opportunity to do wherever you end going, if you go. Um, we went to places like theater and museums. There's this really cool Soviet-era style museum in Kazan where we went and sung every, every week. We would sing like Soviet songs. And um, we also went to like mosques and this is called the Temple of All Religions. It's actually a museum. It's a really cool building. And this is a poster for elections. So we, we also got to, like, I went with my parents, my host parents to the polls to see the book for the president. Um, and then we also got to travel around Russia, which was, I guess, I guess that was the coolest part. Because we got to go to Moscow, um, which that's us in Moscow, on Red Square. And we, we went to the Academy Board, which is like, pretend this is Russia and this is Moscow, it's around here. Um, I know that's super descriptive of here with me. And this is a picture of the city. And we also got to travel by train, which was the coolest part because you get kind of these tiny compartments and you, you share a lot. You share food and you share memories and everyone can hear you because the walls are really thin. Um, and then we also got to those <coughs> entire villages. So about three villages we went to during the course of the year. We also stayed with both families for a night or two. And I think this is my little sister from one of them. I, it, it's kind of a bizarre thing that I would normally never do here. Like go, go to someone's house in America and stay with them for a night. Um, but it was a really cool, I guess, experience for cultural exchange. Um, especially because we had to see what life was like in the province, like outside of Kazan. And my host family was the best. I stayed with um, a retired couple who had their own children. So they were grandchildren. There were like, like a ton of relatives I didn't know who they were running around, which was great because I got to practice Russian. And um, I also ended up like, with, like I said, with a really cool group. I with a really cool group of friends. So international students and local students. This is us at the synagogue. And we went to synagogue. The girl in the middle is a local student who took us there. She's actually Muslim, but she went there for I guess lessons every week, and she did a song with her. So we got to sit in the synagogue in Russia and listen to lessons with her Muslim friend, which I guess that wouldn't happen here because we're not in Russia. Um, <laughs> so that's pretty much all I had for you. I mean, there's a lot more I could talk or could speak about, but I want to give Aaron a chance to talk about Gatchina and how cool St. Petersburg is. But um, keep in mind that even with Places like Russia, um, where politics are changing quite quickly, um, they're going to keep things to our forever around, hopefully. Um, the program for Russian year is now in Moldova. So you can go to Moldova if you get in the year program, which is super cool. How many of you know where Moldova is? Oh, yeah, it's smattering. It's good. <laughs> it's right. It's a tiny country beside, like, between Russia, well, like, here's Russia, here's Ukraine, here's Moldova, and here's Romania. And they speak the language is close to Romania but they also speak Russian there, so it's part of the Soviet Union. So um, please feel free to email me if you have any questions, and I think good luck. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce a, a neighbor, a student who lives in the neighborhood, but who attends Durham Academy, Aaron Seawalt Beats, who this summer studied in Russia. Thank you so much for coming, Aaron. Thank you for so, as you all know, I'm a senior at Durham Academy. Um, I went to Gatchina, Russia this summer, which is a small town about the size of Durham. Well, not small, I suppose, but smaller than Kazan. Um, it's just south of St. Petersburg. So, in some ways, I think that I got the best of the sites in Russia just because we got to have a small town where we don't have to deal with the crazy transportation, which 
the, trans the public transportation was crazy. You could have a bus that was supposed to be there, I don't know, at 10 o'clock, and it would arrive at 10.30. Russians have a really, really weird sense of being on time, which I never really understood. But um, then we also got to travel to St. Petersburg, which was an amazing experience because it's kind of the center of Imperial Russia, and there are tons of museums and churches which we got to visit on the weekends. So this was my Mystic Wide Room, and the restaurant, the cafe that we went to every day for lunch called Cafe Shanghai, where we had a Russian food. <laughs> I, I assumed that they had some kind of Asian food on the menu. We never had it, but presumably it was there. Um, so I was at a in the town of Gatchina. Um, Gatchina has a beautiful palace that's, for the Romanovs, very simple. Um, it was, and then it has the Priory Palace, which is in this picture, which was a hunting palace for the Tsars, which was about, I don't know, a mile from the other palace. I'm not quite sure why, but. Um, and we got to visit these palaces after schools on Wednesdays, like people have said, there are cultural excursions every day after school. And one example was we went to the palace another day, we learned how to cook blini, which are little Russian crepes. Um, another day, we, uh, let's see, we went to a aircraft engine museum and got told a lot of Soviet propaganda about how wonderful their planes were, which was a great experience. It was it was really interesting because the guy kept telling us things about how this is true, it is, it is a fact, and then we would just continue with something that all of us just didn't believe a word of, but it was instructive. So I loved Russian food. It was one of the highlights. I was very wary of it initially because I was told that it was something that was going to be a bit of an adjustment, but in reality it was it was great. There were <coughs> I mean, maybe a few too many potatoes, because I think every meal that I had, there were some potatoes. But it was, I, I really loved it. Like I said, there are, that's green. Um, then that's borscht, which is beet soup, which sounds kind of gross, but it was quite tasty as well. Um, so we had, as I mentioned, food at uh, Cafe Shanghai every day. Um, but then we also had food with our host families um, every morning and in the evening and on the weekends. And there are many different kinds of Russian food. Um, they have a little sashliki when you go to the dacha, um, which is their country homes. They grill that. Um, and then you can have things like um, kasha, which is buckwheat, which I didn't love, but that was about the only thing I didn't like. Um, so as I mentioned, we went into St. Petersburg on two of the weekends. So this is uh, Peter and Paul's fortress, which is where all of the tombs of the czars are. We got to go inside and see that, which was pretty cool. Um, this is the Church on the Spilled Blood. Um, we didn't get to go inside it, but it has amazing architecture, and it really stands out. So St. Petersburg is a truly European city. And then there's this, which doesn't look like anything else there. Um, and then this is the Hermitage, which is an amazing art museum that we got to spend like three hours in, which was kind of ridiculous because I think you can spend weeks there and not see everything. Um, and then that one was, I believe, Isaac's Cathedral, which was um, used as a museum during the time of the Soviet Union, but now part of it has returned to being a church. Um, and then other weekend excursions that we did were go to the areas surrounding St. Petersburg. So this is the picture of the main cathedral on Kronstadt, which we went to on Naval Bay, which was extra fun because, of course, at, during the summer, Russia and the US weren't exactly on the friendliest of terms, so we were told to not look American or speak English loudly because who knows what could happen when you have drunken sailors. But, um, then on the top is a picture of uh, Nabokov's country home. Nabokov was a famous Russian writer who wrote Lolita, um, if you know his work. I didn't before going to Russia, but um, he had to flee Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution. 
um, because he was part of the aristocracy. Um, and then the palace on the top over there is Catherine's Palace, which is an amazingly ornate palace, which has uh, everything's gilded. I think almost everything's gilded in there. But um, then on the last weekend, we went to Kronstadt, which is known, or no, sorry, that's Kronstadt. We went to uh, Peterhof, which is known for its fountains. And that's a picture of the main fountain. Um, I think that. The last, the last night we went to St. Petersburg and watched the bridges rings, um, and then went to the airport. Um, and I, standing there, I, we were all really sad because going to Gatchina was an amazing experience. We all, we all learned a lot about ourselves, about Russia, and it, I think that going to Russia during this this summer was it, it was a crazy experience because on the one hand you have the ridiculous international stuff going on. We, we were there when the plane was shot down. Um, and I don't know, we, we were all kind of scared on a level going there that everyone, once they found out that we were American, would hate us. But that just wasn't the case. We think of international relations on a very country to country level, but once you get down to the personal level, everyone was really friendly. I made great friends there with Americans and Russians. And you also kind of realize about yourself that maybe we don't consider the perspectives of other countries as much as we think we do. And I don't know. It was an amazing program that I hope all of you apply to because it was a great experience. Okay, last but not least, uh, one of our students, Noah Gavinis, is going to come up and he's going to talk to you about his summer experience in China and also talk I think, a little bit about the nuts and bolts of applying for the program. So please welcome Noah. Chinese people, um, 
they really, they, there's a lot of value and they like their gardens. Um, they like the rock work and um, it was really pretty to see. And then we got to see the Pearl Tower and go all the way to the top. Um, and that's this tower right here. And that was really cool. Um, and then in Jiaxing, there's the South Lake, which is where the Communist Party was founded. In, uh, a boat just like this, this is a rather boat that um, the Communist Party was founded in. So there's a lot of um, political things there. Um, and it's also got a lot of really beautiful boats and statues that people have put up. And this is a picture from the top of the pagoda. And this is the whole lake out here. And they have a lot of bridges and little boats that go through. Um, so our first community service trip that we took was to an orphanage. Um, this really opened my eyes up. Um, I'd never been to anything like this. A lot of the kids there were girls um, because some of the more traditional Chinese families um, value boys more, um, from what I learned, and most of them were disabled. Um, so we got to spend about two hours with those kids, and I arm wrestled with this guy. Um, it took me about an hour to get him to talk. He was really closed up and he didn't want to talk to anyone. Um, and then there was a kid who was deaf, and um, one of the kids on the trip, one of the American kids on the trip with me, um, has a little sister who they adopted from China, and she's deaf, and so he knows some Chinese sign language, so he got to talk to her, so that was pretty cool. Um, we went to Hangzhou, this was one of the trips. Um, this is the West Lake. Um, I had to take a lot of pictures of people fishing because we had to do a project, um, that we presented at the end of the trip, um, where we sort of, they wanted us to go out and talk to the locals and ask them questions. We picked a simple topic like you know, sports, I picked fishing. So I went to all the lakes and all the rivers and talked to all the fishermen and got pictures with them. So that was my project. Um, the food there, um, it was not like Chinese, uh, American Chinese food at all. Um, this is Jiaozi, this is my favorite food. It's, pretty, it's just dumplings. Um, they had cicadas on a stick. Um, they really love watermelon. Um, and I love watermelon. <laughs> and they, there's a lot of rules when you're eating. Um, you, know, you can't put your chopsticks in your rice, both standing straight up. I mean, it's like death. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of really like, you know, rules that they sort of, the orientation the weekend, or the couple days in Washington, D.C., they sort of went over, you know, where you uh, put your chopsticks, when you're not eating with them, and um, stuff like that. But the food was really good. It took a little bit of time to get used to. Um, there were things like duck feet, but by the end, I was trying everything, and I loved it. Um, we had music classes where we got to try out the traditional instruments. And the kids there were actually, these middle school students were traveling to Germany to play um, in Germany and sort of travel around. So, Pretty good. Wujian um, is another water town. It's one of the bigger ones, and people actually live there. This is a trash boat, and he, it's kind of like a like a truck that comes around and picks up everybody's trash. He just goes along the river and picks up trash. Um, it's it's known for their cloth dyeing. Um, they'll dye all these really long cloths and then just hang them up, and that was really really cool to see. Um, and then this picture. Up in the right hand corner was a guy who was just sitting on a boat, and all these birds will just go and sit on their boats with him. Um, they're not even scared of humans. Pretty cool. Um, and then I spent a couple weekends in Pingu with my host family. That's where they were actually from originally. They lived in Jiaxing, but they had an apartment in Pingu. Um, and that's where my host brother's grandfather lived. Um, and that was sort of a small, even smaller town than Jiaxing. Um, and they have, at night, everything is lit up, the pagoda right there, and they have, um, they actually have a watermelon festival in Pingu, and so all like the street lamps are shaped like watermelons, um, <laughs> so that was pretty cool, and we got to go on some of the old buildings and look um, at some of that stuff. Um, so this is a picture of my host family right here. I had a younger brother who was 14, and then um, that's my host mom and my dad. Um, they, uh, they they had an apartment in Jiaxing, and um, you know I spent the weekends making food with them. I made them um, mashed potatoes and steak one night. 
um, and they really like that, American <laughs> State. Um, and then you have to wear these little slipper things. Um, when you go in the house, you have to take off your shoes and put these on, and that was pretty cool. Um, and it, their beds, I slept on my first brother's bed, um, and he slept on the floor even though they had a couch because they, the beds are really hard there. Um, it's pretty much just like a wooden box with a straw mat on top to keep you cool. Um, and I asked him, because they have a nice couch, and I asked him, why are you sleeping on the floor and not the couch? And he said, because it's not comfortable. I like the hard floor. <laughs> so um, that was pretty cool. And um, I'm still in contact with them. Um, I love talking to them. It was such a great experience to be able to stay there and um, see you know, how they looked what they thought of America and the rest of the world, and um, it really opened my eyes. You do get to look at things from a different point of view. Um, much better if you go to another country and get to stay with people there. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the timeline for the application. Um, October 30th is when the online application is due, so you've got a little time um, for that. November 19th is when your teacher recommendation is due, so you should start talking to them if you're interested. You don't have to, but you should. Um, November 20th is when um, you have to have all your signed um, materials from school turned in with your transcript. And then the interviews start in December and they go to early February. And then they'll let you know by April 30th. Um, and just go to nsliyforyouth.org if you need any more information. But it is a great program. I do um, suggest that you apply, at least for the summer. I'm applying for the year, too. So.